Yeah, I'm, I, I, I am on a drug. It's called Charlie Sheen. Cocaine use continues to increase despite the war on drugs. Cocaine. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the second most common drug of abuse I see in the emergency room. Please don't die. Hey, hey. Back door, Johnny. In this video, let me share with you one of its most acute and life-threatening complications: a cocaine-induced heart attack. Snorting cocaine works in one to five minutes with the peak effects at 20 minutes lasting one to two hours. It causes blood vessels to constrict throughout the body, including the heart. Years living a party lifestyle can lead to premature plaque formation on the blood vessel walls. A cocaine and cigarette binge can trigger too much blood vessel constriction, potentially spasming and blocking the flow of oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. This is an acute coronary syndrome, more commonly known as a heart attack. Among those with cocaine-induced acute coronary syndrome, the vast majority are men. The average age is 33 years old. 90% are regular cocaine users and 80% are regular cigarette smokers. That being said, there are outliers. Cool success story took a tragic turn this morning. Len Bias, the Maryland University basketball star on his way to becoming a world champion Boston Celtic, died of an apparent heart attack today at Leland Memorial Hospital in Prince George's County. Assuming it was a cocaine-induced heart attack that led to his death, it would play out something like this. As the heart muscle starts to die, it doesn't conduct electricity the way it should. The abnormal electrical activity ends up becoming more and more erratic and the heart starts pumping in rhythms that are not conducive to forward blood flow within the circulatory system. Ultimately, the lack of forward blood flow leads to decreased oxygen to the brain, the person passing out. The heart itself starts to have compromised blood flow and ultimately stops beating irreversibly. The first sign of a heart attack is the muscle moving abnormally. As the ischemia sets in and the muscle is receiving less and less oxygen, it begins to falter. You'd only see this on real-time imaging, such as an echocardiogram. The most practical assessment tool we have is an electrocardiogram. In 1924, a Dutch physician and physiologist won the Nobel Prize for creating a machine capable of capturing the electrical activity of the heart from the skin. He also did the first work in interpreting what these waveforms meant and creating the language used to describe them. A nomenclature we use to this day. The electrical movement within the heart is sometimes altered by the dead or dying cardiac muscle. If you can interpret an EKG and you know your anatomy, you can tell which part of the heart muscle is dying, narrowing down which blood vessel is blocked. We do have blood work to help guide our decision making. Troponins are a heart muscle protein normally absent in the blood. Their presence is indicative of heart damage in the past two to three days. The problem is, is that they don't appear in the blood work right away. So if someone is having a heart attack or had a heart attack in the past few hours, that blood test may come out negative. On arrival to the emergency room, we have about five pieces of information to gauge whether or not we think the person is having an active heart attack. Number one, how they look number two, their symptoms, number three, the EKG, number four, the vital signs, and number five, their personal history. Gasping for air, clutching their chest, and that's highly consistent with the heart attack, and obviously our index of suspicion would be very, very high. Uh, number two, the symptoms. So there's the classic symptoms, left-sided chest pain, crushing an elephant sitting on the chest. Um, if someone is having those symptoms, then the likelihood of them having a true heart attack or active heart attack is much greater. Uh, number three, the EKG. Depending on the heart attack, the electrical activity may be diagnostic of it. The vital signs uh, help us gauge how their 
cardiovascular system and their cardiopulmonary system is holding up um, during this time of stress. And finally, their personal history. If they're telling you about all these risk factors like cocaine use, smoking, uh, past history of heart attacks, um, while they're having these new symptoms or they're telling you that their current symptoms are completely consistent with issues they've had in the past, then that means a lot. The pillars of treating a heart attack are restoring blood flow to the heart and supporting the cardiovascular system while it works through the insult. The way we support the cardiovascular system is by controlling the heart rate, the blood pressure, um, even the person's breathing, uh, potentially with the use of life support. One of the initial critical actions is deciding whether or not the person meets criteria for receiving clot-busting medicine. Clot-busting medicines are indicated if there's very specific electrical changes on the EKG consistent with active heart attack. Clot-busting medicines are dangerous because they can cause bleeding, and the less of it you can use, the better. It's, it's like Drano for unclogging pipes, except for human. An interventional cardiologist in an interventional suite with a catheterization lab team would attempt to thread a wire into the blocked blood vessel and either physically remove it, or they would put the clot-busting medicine directly at the site of the clot, thereby minimizing the amount of it they need to use. If there is no procedural capability at the facility to attempt um, a targeted intervention, then we would give the clot-busting medicine systemically, um, despite the risks, because in that case, the benefit would outweigh the risk. Because heart attacks are life-threatening, time-sensitive, and common, the initial approach is algorithmic with a low threshold to initiate treatment while details come back over the next number of hours. The initial treatments would include thinning the blood, stopping platelets from clumping together, and lowering the blood pressure. Over the next number of hours, we'd see whether or not the person's symptoms improved, we'd see results of the blood work, we'd be ruling out other illnesses, we would see whether or not there's any dynamic changes on the electrical activity of their heart. We'd also be gauging their supports at home, um, because if they're not having an active heart attack and we have ruled out other illnesses, then we'd also be risk stratifying them to gauge whether or not we'd need to contact any specialists on their behalf. Um, would they need to stay in the hospital? Could they go home? Should they go home? Um, so on and so forth. An antidote for both the vasoconstriction and the increased heart rate or the surge of adrenaline caused by the cocaine is sedatives, more specifically benzodiazepines. Where cocaine ramps you up, benzodiazepines bring you down. In medical settings, we use stronger versions of Xanax to relax the blood vessels and slow down the heart rate. Players, here's your clue. You have 30 seconds, good luck. The answer is PCP. PCP functions like a dissociative anesthetic similar to ketamine. We commonly use ketamine for procedures to create that out-of-body experience so the person doesn't feel the painful procedure that they need. PCP was popularized in the 90s in New York City and is still pretty commonly used in the Northeast. And the way they mention it in the question, the fluctuating state from near catatonia to hostility and aggression is what you see. Usually if the goal is to get messed up, then you're dealing with someone who's going through it. Cocaine use is less likely in this case. Um, he starts off catatonic and then becomes aggressive. With cocaine, you'd be amped up the whole time. And also his heart rate is within normal limits, which with cocaine, you'd expect tachycardia or an increased heart rate. Same with methamphetamine. With methamphetamine, you would expect a amped up state, um, both behaviorally and on the vital signs with the heart rate. Um, diazepam is Valium, a benzodiazepine, a downer. With that, you'd expect the person to be really calm and if it's near overdose, you'd expect some form of respiratory depression. And finally, oxycodone, an opiate. So with opiate overdoses, you'd see the person um, 
be difficult to wake up. They'd be sleepy, difficult to wake up. Their breathing would be shallow and diminished. So those are the people that would potentially need Narcan or, um, or mechanical ventilation if they're not breathing. It's called cocaine, and you don't want no part of this shit. Cocaine? It turns all your bad feelings into good feelings. It's a nightmare. Demand for cocaine has stayed high despite 50 years of an aggressive drug war. But the war on drugs will be hard won neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block. People make self-destructive choices all the time. I'm thinking maybe I'd like to try me some of that cocaine. Alcohol and cigarettes are perfect examples. And for the record, cocaine is not significantly more harmful than either. Cocaine legalization and regulation may seem like a ridiculous idea, but it shouldn't. The potential benefits may include eliminating a major source of revenue for criminal organizations, developing a new tax stream for social programs, freeing up police to focus on violent crime, unclogging the courts, and reducing prison population size. People don't want to be drug addicts, and they're a lot more likely to seek help if they're not going to be treated like criminals. We've already transformed a national attitude of tolerance into one of condemnation. In terms of the cocaine problem, taking care of loved ones but putting yourself first is what to do on an individual level. On a community level, pragmatic public health policies are the way to go. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you've made it all the way to the end of the video, then you are the real MVP and I appreciate you. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, thanks.